Um, welcome, everybody. Ooh, the lights are flashing. Um, Ed Edward is away, so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, our speaker. Our speaker today is Sabina Leonelli. She's joining us from the University of Exeter, where she is a professor of history and philosophy of science and co-director of the eGenis, the Exeter Center for the Study of the Life Sciences. She earned her bachelor's degree in STS from University College London, a master's degree in HPS from the London School of Economics, and her PhD from the Free University in Amsterdam in 2007. Um, since 2004, she's published over 75 articles in two books. That's a, a daunting pace of research to try to have to keep up with. Her most recent book is Data-Centric Biology, a Philosophical Study, which came out with the University of Chicago Press in 2016. Uh, Sabina is internationally recognized for groundbreaking research that pushes the boundaries of HPS in four major areas. She does amazing research on the epistemology of data-intensive science, and we'll hear more about that today. She also has done a considerable amount of work on model organisms, their history and epistemology, as well as open science and data sharing issues and translational research in the plant sciences. Please help me welcome Sabina Leonello. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for the wonderful introduction I'll never live up to. And thank you very much for hosting me here. And really, I'm very grateful to be here. It's the first time I visit the center, and I'm very excited by that. Of course, there's lots of friends here and people I looked up to uh, for pretty much all of my career since I was a student. So I'm very excited to be here. So what I'm going to, to do today with you is to go through a talk which I just put together. It's um, an attempt to try and sketch a book that I'm currently working on, which I'm hoping to finish next year, um, which is looking at the epistemology of data use. And I'm hoping that you will see what I mean by this as I kind of walk you through uh, how I got to um, thinking about this. And uh, this is really targeting specifically the idea of big data which has emerged very strongly over the last few years. Um, you know, as many of us, I'm sure, in the room would agree, this is not a new situation for the sciences, but some of the um, ways in which it's been ma manifested now and some of the technologies which are enabling data, um, uh, big data analysis are indeed novel and they need to be considered from a philosophical viewpoint. So what I'm trying to do is to go towards sketching some of the conditions under which we can think about inferential reasoning in the age of big data science. So um, the talk will proceed as follows. I will start by kind of outlining how I see the promise of big data. I will also talk a little bit about open data, which is a topic that, as Mike said, I've done a lot of work on recently. And um, I will then start to talk a little bit about what I see as the reality of big and open data. And this comes from very extensive empirical work, which I've been doing in the last few years, on uh, the ways in which uh, researchers are actually um, marshalling data, handling data, disseminating them, and using them in a variety of different subfields, particularly within uh, biology and biomedicine. And, uh, and I will tell you something about how we're actually doing that work, which is by doing what we're calling studying data journeys. Then I will get to the core of my talk. And this is a rather controversial claim, but it's uh, something that I came to see after a while of actually discussing issues of uh, big data use with researchers in different fields, and which is the idea that, in fact, uh, big data, far from being a wonderful way to prop science and accelerate discovery, can actually be a very damaging tool for uh, scientific development if they're used under particular conditions. And I'm going to try and list five um, ways in which big data can actually be seen as damaging science rather than enabling it. Uh, one is by actually pushing a certain form of conservatism in scientific work and basically pushing people to use old data rather than producing new ones which are actually suited to what they really want to analyze. Secondly, I'm going to be looking at the problem of what I call convenience sampling. A lot of other people, of course, call convenience sampling. So the problem of actually producing and considering data which are very partial in the way in which they've been, um, in been collected and thinking that they represent much more than they actually um, can, given the ways in which they've been sampled. Then I'm going to be talking about the problem which I'm calling the house of cards. So a situation in which we are potentially building more and more and more databases on data which are actually unreliable or anyhow in a situation where we cannot really determine whether these data are reliable or not and what that does mean in terms of uh, potentially informing inferential reasoning. 
Then I will touch actually more briefly on the last two points. One is the, the question of self-interest and the problem of actually having data which are um, biased in the sense that they're actually being produced with very, very specific and narrow interests in mind, which are non-epistemic interests. And the problem of social damage. So the problem of actually one hand how one handles um, the production and dissemination of data in society, particularly, of course, when, when it comes to personal data and data about um, groups of, in, of um, groups in society. And this will drive towards trying to think about what an epistemology data use could be. And then I what I will do is go through um, some of my own work and some of the work actually of some of the people in this room that actually I think can help in thinking about what the conditions could be to turn this around and actually make sure that when we're using big data to inform inferential reasoning, this can actually be done in a way which is robust and which is sustainable. So this was the plan. Okay, so big and open data in science and society. Well, um, hopefully I don't really need to tell you too much about this. I mean, this is a, a kind of discourse that we're really surrounded by. But the starting point for discussing big data, I think, is the recognition that there are new technologies available for, for producing data. In biology, we call them uh, high throughput technologies. So actually we produce data in vast quantities, very fast, and for storing the data, many, 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 many data, and to do that very fast, and to do that about what people see as pretty much anything and everything. Right? So we're in a situation in which not only we can do that uh, technologically, but also we have increasing amounts of institutional work to try and make sure that these data are stored properly, they're disseminated as wisely as possible, and there are um, institutions that are actually in charge of that dissemination and of uh, promoting the use of this data. So um, I've been doing a lot of work on uh, the kind of open research ecosystem in that sense and the ways in which uh, the open science movement has grown, in a sense, intertwined with the rise of big data. And I think that's, that's very visible in the ways in which uh, this movement is growing. This is the idea that um, you know, open data is the idea that, in fact, um, any piece of uh, published research, any claim that's produced within research should be underpinned by um, making directly accessible, freely accessible, any um, data that actually was used as evidence uh, for that claims. And this, of course, is a sort of, is a new situation in science because this is something that hasn't really been required so far in scientific publishing. So all sorts of changes in how we are publishing scientific results, in how we're potentially producing data. And um, this is also, of course, relating to new forms of analysis of data, and uh, many of which are computationally informed, at the very least. So there's lots of discourses uh, about this. and. Um, there is a strong expectation that this actually provides a sort of gateway to uh, new social behaviors, to services, to self-understanding. And um, there is an argument which I've been defending in my work so far, that in fact all of these developments are providing a whole new status to data themselves in science. So, so far we've been in a situation where actually um, you will be asked to select some of the data that you're actually using to corroborate your claims and show those to the reviewers of your work. And typically, the emphasis in scientific publishing has been on the publication of claims, propositions, very often, that actually are the results of your final insight, your interpretation of a, of a certain data set and a process of producing them. Now, we are in a situation where data themselves as regarded as something which is considered as a research output, something that can be published, something that can be actually valuable in and of itself. And I think that provides all sorts of interesting um, ins um, inspiration and, and a very interesting platform for philosophers to work on. So some of the realistic promises, I think, of using big and open data in research are things like, well, I mean, that certainly can incentivate people to use, reuse data more often. So rather than keeping data relative to only just one uh, situation of interpretation and then to whatever claim comes out to one particular um, site of data production, we are in a situation where people are actually encouraged whenever they're doing research, not just to produce data themselves, but to look around and see whether any other group has produced a data set that could potentially inform also their own research. So there's a strong emphasis on trying to reuse data as much as possible. And the idea also is that this relates to um, trying to um, decrease the waste of data and the loss of data. 
So if we encourage people to reuse data, then we also give new status to the idea that actually throwing away a lot of data after you finish a project could be potentially a waste because maybe you haven't found those data particularly interesting for your own purposes, but somebody who's asking a different research question may find those same data interesting to look at. And this, of course, is particularly relevant in situations where producing certain data sets is a very costly and very time in, in, in intensive and labor intensive exercise. Um, another way in which I think um, this kind of discussion is um, is really uh, making promises which are rather realistic, is the idea that, in fact, it's pushing um, on a, towards a reinvention of what it means to exchange scientific results. As I was saying before, and also we see now, like for instance, the emergence of so-called data journals as a way in which people can publish. So what you do in data journals is you actually publish a data set. You refrain from publishing an interpretation to that data set. What you publish is the data set metadata which are justified in the publication and the methodologies through which you actually produce those data. So you see all sorts of different ways in which people are trying to think about how we can communicate these kinds of results without necessarily tying them to the publication of a paper which contains an, inter an, an interpretation, an interpretative claim. And this is creating all sorts of new forms of inference in the sciences, and also lots of different kinds of collaborations across disciplines and across countries. And um, as you see, my work mostly looks at the ways in which people are disseminating data through databases, and even just the ways in which we are creating data infrastructure in the sciences shows, like, and in fact embodies many of these novel discussions between people that within the same field or across fields are trying to establish what is the best way to um, choose data of relevance for dissemination, what kind of metadata, what kind of information about the data we want to attach to those data, and what potential uses do we foresee that we need to um, take account of when we are putting together these data infrastructures. And finally, um, one of the things that uh, a lot of philosophers have already started to discuss is the idea that um, using big data and open data and data mining algorithms is actually facilitating research as a heuristic. So what it can really help us to do is to try and spot research areas which haven't quite been covered yet, spot new directions in research, and inspire the ways in which actually we're planning research. So data mining helps you to spot gaps, helps you to spot opportunities, and we can in that sense think about a data-driven research planning process. Um, now, here's a set of what I regard as less realistic promises which are associated to big data, and uh, I will get why I think that these are um, unrealistic promises. I've also written quite a bit about this in, in, in previous work. And um, I think a good book uh, to have a look at all the unrealistic promises that are made in relation to big data is this one. I regard as a bit of a compendium of, of um, potentially problematic promises which are uh, relating to this. And one of the ones that I am particularly unhappy with is the idea of comprehensiveness. So there is a strong discourse in, in a lot of big data analytics circles about the fact that because we have so many different sources of data in our society, also data that are relevant to research, then we're in a situation that basically we can pretty much assume we have data about almost any aspect of a phenomenon that we are interested in, and that all we need to do is to look for that data. Somebody else will have produced it. We haven't done it, but somebody else will actually have done it for us. So as long as we have the right databases, as long as we have the right data mining tools, we may be able to harness that knowledge and put it all together and have a wonderful comprehensive view of the world. Now, this argument has several implications, and two of them are particularly troubling to me. One is the idea that, well, you don't actually then need to worry at all anymore about whether your data are accurate, whether the sources of your data are in any way reliable, what kind of trustworthiness um, do, do these data infrastructures actually have. All you need to worry about is to have um, kind of an abundance enough of data and like um, um, and many data sources that you can actually put together. And then this acts as a sort of process of triangulation where, well, even if there are some inaccuracies or some kind of unreliable data in one data set, then hopefully whatever inaccuracies there are will be corrected by us actually consulting all sorts of other sources of data on the same phenomenon. And so by triangulating data in this way, we can actually counter any problem that we may have with bias in the collection of data and interpretation of data. So we can actually, as long as we have lots and lots and lots of data, basically about all sorts of things, we can start to worry much less about the procedures through which data are actually being produced. 
So again, a consequence of thinking in those terms is that the very, very important and in fact fundamental debate around how do you sample uh, within the sciences becomes redundant. We don't really need to worry about sampling issues anymore because just by virtue of having all sorts of different data sets we can consult, we can overcome whatever problem you may have with the sampling of one data set. So this is one set of issues. Um, another set of issues that I know, like many of you are also very interested in, is the idea that, well, again, because of this abundance, uh, abundance of data, we can start to think that, in fact, we can have all sorts of um, correlations arising from the data, and that having such a rich kind of correlative knowledge coming out of the data, we can infer from the data, in fact, trumps any um, discussion around which of these correlations translates into kind of slightly more reliable a uh, causal inference. So why worry about causal inference when we have all this correlative knowledge? Let's just look at that and try and use that in a kind of predictive sense and abandon the idea that we have to find some sort of truer causal relations that can actually help us explain the phenomena that we see in the world. Um, again, I'm translating kind of the kind of promises that we find in this kind of literature. I'm not saying what I think about this. Um, and then the final one, which again troubles me quite a bit, is um, the idea that, well, if this is all true, and we are going to be very soon in a situation in which we have all sorts of um, data sources, very sophisticated ways of mining them, and, uh, the, um, um, and we're going to have ever more advanced um, data mining tools and artificial intelligence tools that are actually learning from the work we've already done in analyzing data. Well, soon enough, we're going to get to a situation where scientists themselves are just not needed. We can automate the whole process of discovery. All we need to do is to ask a question to the computer, and this is what kind of lots of cartoons of this type are, are trying to say. Um, <laughs> And we're going to get the answer eventually, because it's a lot to churn, churn through the numbers, like churn through what is learned from previous interactions with the world, with different data sets, with different ways in which we want to interpret the data, and we're going to be able to get inferences straight out of a machine. So in this cartoon, for instance, the idea is that this is the AI of the past, where you have like a computer that tells you invalid input and data overload and zzz, zzz, analysis error and all of this to the AI of tomorrow, which is going to tell you things like um, my report is on your desk, your shoe late is untied, and tomorrow is your wedding anniversary, etc., etc. And of course, all the results of your science, because you really don't need to do any work yourself anymore as a scientist. There's a lot of problems with this. I mean, we could talk quite a bit about um, one very important project that was actually conducted in biology, which was called the robot scientist, which is sort of still ongoing, that was trying to do exactly that. And uh, the fact that really it didn't go particularly well until now, but I'm not going to talk about this um, today. And what I want to talk about is the ways in which we have been trying to tackle some of these issues um, as uh, philosophers of science in my institute and in the group that I have now. So we got funding from the European Research Council um, to carry out a project which is called the Epistemology of Data Intensive Science. And the idea of this project was that basically it comes in two parts. One part is rather empirical, and what we're trying to do there is to um, use the questions that we have about the realm of big data and data dissemination coming from philosophy to inform some empirical work and qualitative work about how actually data are being handled, disseminated, and reused by the researchers who are uh, tr trying to do that in different fields. So uh, how we're doing this, we call it tracking data journeys. And the idea here is to try and understand how data move from sites in which they're actually being produced to sites in which they're being disseminated to sites in which they're actually being interpreted, used, and reused. And what are the consequences of following data through these journeys? We are particularly interested, of course, in intricate data journeys. So we are interested in situations where there is a um, strong role for databases and data infrastructures as sites for dissemination of the data, which means that you have a situation where you have a certain set of sites in research who are producing the data. These data then get incorporated into a database that's supposed to serve many, many, many more researchers and more context of potential reuse very often internationally. And then uh, we want to look at um, cases in which data that are extracted from databases and data infrastructures are actually being reused for a variety of purposes, which are very different from the ones for which the data were originally produced. So the project was set up uh, specifically around this, and it was also uh, based on some of the work I've done previously on databases specifically, as a very interesting, as providing a very interesting uh, window to study the uh, conditions under which data actually can be made 
reusable to contexts which are not the ones um, in which they were originally produced. So we use them as windows for, to try and understand the material, the conceptual, and the institutional work that is required to make data widely accessible and usable by people who are not the original creators of the data. So for instance, we've uh, focused quite a bit on the use of labels of data, how do we classify data so that they're actually retrievable by people who are not the ones who originally produced them, which very often ends up being a very um, theoretical discussion because what you're actually really trying to define is how you characterize phenomena that researchers will use as um, crucial variables in, in thinking about even how they formulate their questions into a database of this sort. And also looking at the software which is used to classify, model, visualize, and retrieve the data. Also, we try to look at other elements like how these infrastructures are actually managed and how the communications around them are managed. And in the cases of actually looking at how data can be gets extracted from databases and reused, we are looking at the conditions under which data can actually be interpreted in this way, what this involves in terms of thinking about uh, discovery and thinking about what co counts as good research in the first place, and what is the role of open science and the open data movement in this way of generating knowledge. So the methods we're using are, um, for this kind of more empirical part of the work, are uh, qualitative by and large. We're looking at archival work, we're looking at scientific literature. We've done about um, 120 in-depth interviews of about two to three hours with different people working in data management and data interpretation in relation to our case studies. We've done a lot of participant observation and ethnographies and um, following uh, different cases and different fields around and quite literally actually following the data around and the people who are um, carrying them around and the ways in which their um, databases are set up and trying to document the attitudes of researchers to things like data openness, how they think about data curation, authorship and reuse. And in fact, in many cases, this ended up being uh, us collaborating with the sciences directly in many of their projects and actually having a direct involvement in data journeys. Um, and I should say, actually, the main uh, work has been done by myself, um, one postdoc called Nicola Tempini, who is working mostly on biomedicine, one PhD student called Gregor Halfman, who's working on oceanography, and then a whole other set of um, associated researchers and postdocs who are doing um, other different bits of fieldwork. So, and what we'd also be trying to do is to do a sort of comparative analysis across research areas and also across countries to try and get at some of the differences that one may find there. So we look at lots of different types of data, different kinds of research goals, different methods, instru instruments. Uh, we look at the ways in which area-specific requirements and norms are affecting data journeys, also including some of the political economy of actually um, using the data and the ethos and the norms of, of these particular, of, of the communities we're engaged in. We looked at some of the regulatory frameworks and the ways in which also they're shaped at the institutional and political level. And we also started to look at the differences between uh, research environments which are, if you want, um, high income, which have a lot of resources at their disposal, and research environments we don't have that. So this is an example of one of these data journeys, one of the ones I know the most about. Uh, this is an, an, um, a database um, which collects data on a particular model organism, Arabidopsis thaliana, little plant which actually is uh, the main model organism still for the plant sciences. And I've been actually following this database now for about um, 13 years, so it's a long time to be involved with them. I'm in the steering committee now, um, so it's kind of is an evolving relationship. And so what we've been trying to track is the ways in which the data which are submitted to this database are produced and the ways in which people who browse the database are able to obtain all sorts of different visualizations of the data and everything that it takes to actually be able to obtain such visualizations. And even just for this particular database, I would say there's about maybe um, a thousand experts involved all over the world in producing tools that enable people who work at this database to frame their data is usable in particular ways. So there would be work uh, going, for instance, standardizing the material specimens on which data are produced, so the actual plants, and there are stock centers to do that. There will be work on which kind of labels we use 
to um, be able to make the data retrievable. So there are things like the bioontologies, and this will be the plant ontology, on which I worked for a long time, um, thinking about how do you uh, label this work. There's a lot of uh, work done on the uh, software that is used and the storage capabilities that are used <coughs> for this. One of the big projects here is now called Cyverse. It's based in the States. And a lot of work on what does it mean to standardize data formats to enable things like, in this case, cross-species analysis. So how do, how do we do this? And there, are, there is an organization, for instance, called Intermine that actually is in charge purely of thinking about how does one put together standards which are being um, elaborated to study one particular organism and how does one make them commensurable in any way or at least interoperable with standards that have been put together to um, study other organisms. And then we've done lots of other work on other, um, on other types of, um, um, of uh, research. And in fact, one of the interesting things that we found is that this kinds of representation here, which is a terrible one, you will agree, um, is a highly simplified one anyhow, is not even possible for these kinds of environments. There's just too much going on. What you find here is a very intricate, nested landscape of databases and data infrastructures that build upon each other, though they're sponsored by different people, they're actually curated by very different um, groups who are taking care of different, of different um, uh, research environments. So we've done some work on the ways in which health and environmental data are integrated and brought together, like through um, a project that was focusing precisely on this, based in the UK. We've done work on how um, biomedical data specifically is collected from sources as varied as from hospitals and um, um, medical practitioners, clinical trials, and research on animal studies, and anonymized in a way that actually makes it possible for other researchers to come and use it. And there's a lot to say about this particular case. We've done much more work on cross-species analysis, and particularly looking at things like um, the reuse of uh, data produced on yeast species to address issues to do with human health, and particularly cancer. And we've dav uh, I've done, particularly myself, quite a lot of work on the ways in which, oops, in which uh, plant data are traveling around the world and the ways in which they are being um, analyzed and labeled is being used and applied in all different parts of the world. So this summer I was in Nigeria looking at how some of the labels produced for um, uh, the um, morphology of plants in France and in the UK is now being applied in the fields of people that are producing cassava plants to try and help them to um, identify data that relate to particular plant traits and then kind of circulate them across the world. So now uh, all of this work has given me some cause of um, worry, if not to say despair, about some of these initiatives and this is what I want to share with you today. So. I think there are five ways, as I said, in which big data can actually damage science. And I want to give you some idea of the dimensions that came out of these kinds of work. And this is where the project is actually coming into its more philosophical phase, when we're doing some more work on what this actually means for understanding the epistemology of science and for understanding what it means to do inference on data, which is um, uh, handled and managed in this way. So I'm going to start from the first way in which I think big data can manage science, which is to favor, co uh, favor co conservatism over innovation. So as I said, we are looking at a landscape in which we have a nested, very complicated um, set of databases which collect very different types of data and follow very different types of approaching, approaches in doing that. And it's actually very, very difficult to make all these different data sources interoperable, so to make it possible for people to access um, uh, infrastructure in which you can at least relate these different data sources to each other, even if you, can, you can't just unify them, at least make it possible to look at them comparatively and make use of them in some way in your research. So to do that, you have to use language, which is in some way standardized. So again, this idea of using ontologies, kind of particularly bioontologies in, in, in biology, to try and make it possible to consult data in this way. You have to agree, which is probably even more important, on how you describe the information you provide about the data themselves. So you have to agree on what people call metadata. And there's a lot of work going on on this, I'll show you in a moment. And one of the movements that I've been following is the movement around minimal information about biological and biomedical investigation, which is um, a movement which is going on now for more than 10 years in trying to find ways of describing experimental practices in ways that can actually 
carry across a large numbers of experimental situations. This resonates, of course, as you can see, with the kind of work that we're doing in philosophy of science, just that is applied now in the sciences with big implications for how we're then analyzing the data. And of course, there's lots of um, work around what possible standards could there be for what can count as reliable data? What does it mean to talk about data quality in these kinds of environments and about their evidential significance? One of the things that is very, very worrying around all of this work is that, in fact, it turns out to be extremely challenging not just to develop the content of databases, which in involves a lot of expertise, both on the actual uh, target system that is being uh, studied and also on the kind of software and the kind of data formats that are being used, but also on updating databases. They tend to be funded in lots of different haphazard ways. Basically, no database we've been studying as any long-term prime for survival. Uh, it's basically impossible to get funding pretty much from anywhere, including the NSF here in the, uh, in the States, about actually updating something that's already there. It doesn't fit our kind of novelty-driven um, research system. So what happens is that you get all sorts of uh, resources out there which are being developed put online and not necessarily maintained to a standard which actually uh, maintains the reliability of the data. So first of all, I wanted to uh, show the fact that, well, of course, it's very good to have common standards, but typically needs to, this needs to be complemented by some sort of trained human judgment on how to apply the standards. So this is just to uh, give you an idea. This is the um, so-called ISA tab um, um, way of organizing data, which is now being uh, used as one of the main ways globally to try and arrange data and metadata in uh, databases. Certainly in Europe has been launched as the main standard or kind of meta standard to try and do that, which is divided into a structure where you, the, you have a um, part which concerns the type of investigation you're doing, a description of the study you're doing, the kind of assay you've done, and then the actual data. And this is all part of the metadata you have to do. Now, this is all good and well, it's wonderful. Lots of incredible scientists are working on this. At the same time, the moment you try to apply it, a few things happen. So this is um, an attempt to put together the, an ap applied version of the ISATAB standards in uh, plant phenomics, which is one of the fields I've been studying um, to uh, quite a depth. And this is just one uh, table that gives you the ways in which you would translate these um, you know, apparently very easy triad of types of metadata in the case of phenomics. In fact, this table is three pages long. It's 180 different types of information about the data that you're supposed to have every time you're producing a data set in plant phenomics. Not entirely feasible. But the idea is, well, when lots of plant phenomenists kind of got together and tried to decide this, it was actually the only plausible way for them to think that you would have metadata reliable enough that you could then um, analyze the data properly. This is uh, a paper that we put out last year in Nature Plants on data management, again, in plant science. And here I'm teaming up with some of the top people in plant science who are doing data management and have been doing it for you know, at least two decades, each of them to try and give some information to plant scientists about, well, you know, you want to do open data, you want to produce big data sets and make it available to others. Well, here's some of the things you need to consider, and we're going to try and help you to at least get a sense of what you need to do to be able to do it reliably. So in this table, we are just classifying the type of tool that people need to be aware of and able to use to be able to do what people would regard as proper data management. So they go from open lab books, generic open data repositories, specific databases, data portals, biontologies, metadata standards, identifier for research materials, informatic standards, data rotation pipelines, guidelines of good practice. And uh, after we published this paper, we got all sorts of um, emails and correspondence from other data curators saying, you forgot a very important type of data management. And the point for me to show this table is to say nobody, nobody who is doing um, research work in the field, in the lab, on an everyday basis can possibly uh, be aware of all of this and be aware of how to use them. And in fact, that's what we keep consistently finding. And in fact, I mean, many of the people that I've been working um, with with this paper wouldn't have known it took kind of uh, basically put together five of us even just to come up with this list. So it's very difficult to just ask researchers on the ground to say, well, you know, you want to disseminate your data and produce good big data sets. Well, just follow all these principles and use all these wonderful resources on the web. And there you are. It's very easy. Not quite. Result 
is that, well, first of all, there's no sustainability for databases and related curation, as I was saying before. There's a lack of long-term funds for these initiatives. There's a lack of willingness to invest. Um, there is a very um, firm vision still of data curation and data management as being basically a technical service which requires no in-depth expertise and therefore really is not part of research as need, the people who do data curation really shouldn't be authors of papers, they're just people that provide you with a service. This can be done by a PhD or kind of a low postdoc, it's nothing that actually requires expertise. And um, that also means that because universities also think in those terms, researchers very rarely receive some sort of expert support on data management. So in the absence of some sort of sustainable expert support for data management and curation, many databases tend to disappear, or much worse, many databases actually stagnate. So like they actually become inert objects on the web that people still may think are perfectly functional, so they consult them, they take the data, they reuse them. But in fact, this data is not necessarily reliable, and also people don't really have access to the skills they need to be able to assess how uh, these data have been put together. So, like, there is all sorts of hurdles here in reusing all data which have been badly kept. And also, I mean, what we're seeing very much is a general tendency, in, which is associated to the discourse of, of, around big data, to think that, well, in fact, if we can reuse existing data rather than creating them, well, then maybe we should just gear most of our research towards secondary data analysis rather than thinking about producing primary data that like, are really well suited to the kind of questions that we want to ask. So what does it mean in the long term for creative research and for innovation when you start to privilege work that actually reuses um, data which are already present rather than creating data that um, are really suited to your questions? And this, of course, is particularly problematic in a situation like in biology, biomedicine, but also environmental science, but also like many other sciences where the objects of inquiry are actually evolving and developing. And so like, this is not a stable target that you can just trust the fact that data collected on this particular species 20 years ago is actually reliable to try and assess um, the characteristic of the species today. So now moving on on the second big obstacle, I think, in, um, in having big data in a sort of um, helpful, um, as a help to science, is the fact that we're starting to see um, a, a tendency towards building on unreliable data. What I mean, what I mean by this? Well, I mean that uh, what we're looking at when we're looking at these databases, which are so nasty, so interdependent, and yet are not really sustainable in any obvious way, is a house of cards situation, where you have a big kind of um, house of cards being um, built, where all these databases are interlocked. But if one of the databases actually starts to fail or not being updated properly, then what happens to all the ones that actually depend on those results for their work? And this was one situation we found in the first data journal I showed you around Arabidopsis data, where in fact the third database I showed you went out of business for a while, and it's a very long story how that actually happened, but what it meant is that the data, the ba basic gene annotation data that they were supplying to all the other databases that were relating to the database started to be unreliable. But there was actually no way to address that problem, because now you have another 60 databases that, that uh, depend on that database to provide some of the data that then get um, analyzed and kind of um, further curated in other data infrastructures. So it becomes an insolvable problem, like how do you take care of, um, of, of this interdependence? So this also creates a situation where there are big difficulties in locating error in any way, or in fact in evaluating the provenance of the data and the quality of the data. And this is particularly the case in situations where data travel very far from their context of origin. So they travel far from particular communities of practice towards communities which actually have really no set ideas around how to evaluate the quality of certain data. They're not set ideas about how to evaluate um, some of the instruments that are used or um, some of the specimens that are being used. So in those cases, what I've been arguing is that recontextualizing um, the data, and you do this through metadata, is absolutely crucial to being able to interpret them. But uh, the information that you use to recontextualize data, to actually make sure that you read the significance of the data according to your own epistemic standards in, in your own community, are insufficient. So very often metadata are not even there, or when they are, they're badly selected, they're selected in ways which don't really suit um, your own preferences, or they're badly annotated. 
Also, a very big difficulty we keep finding is that um, even within the same discipline and the same subfields, there are very big differences between um, the ways in which groups of researchers assess the um, quality of the data. So, I mean, the typical example I keep finding is when it comes to microarray data, so data about gene expression, which is foundational type of data for many different types of biology. Different groups of biologists will actually regard those very same data produced by the same standardized machine as of very good quality or very bad quality, depending on the kind of work that they want to engage in. So it becomes very difficult to provide you know, some sort of universal standards for what it means to have good data here. Because a lot of these assessments in practice already seem to depend on the goals that people have and the specific um, ways in which they're going to be interpreting the data. Also, data quality assessments typically depend on access to um, on having access to original materials or the instruments that were used to create the data in the first place. And again, in biology, this is a very strong um, situation in which in lots of um, um, biology done on model organisms, for instance, in order to be able to really assess whether a data set produced by a different group is reliable for your own purposes, very often one of the first things that people do is to order the specimens, either from the original lab or from some sort of stock center, specimens that are sort of seen to be very much like the original specimens on which the original experiment was carried out, and try to work on those to maintain consistency on the materials. But um, what's problematic here is that in many cases, the collection of samples on which data have been originally collected are very unsystematic, very often underfunded, and they're not really linked to each other. Even in the case of biobanking in uh, biomedicine, which is, um, one would think, one of the situations where there's the most funding, the most attention to actually being able to retain some of the original samples and materials on which data are being created. And this makes samples very hard to locate and very hard to relate to data. Similarly, when it comes to instruments, um, very rarely do research groups maintain older instruments which have been produced, uh, which have been used to produce kind of earlier data, kind of older data. I mean, the most blatant case of this is the CERN, of course, where there is still, I think, a couple of people sitting in a corner of the CERN whose only job is to try and transfer floppy disks into CDs and go on and go on and go on. And probably by the time they're almost done, there's going to be a shift and DVDs are going to be out to you and then you're going to start the whole cycle again. So. And this is a place which employs thousands of people and is regarded as one of the ones that has the most resources in science. So, of course, the problem becomes magnified when looking at any one biology lab or any one clinical lab. So, um, the Royal Society has insisted very strongly that data sharing and reuse needs data curation that is actually intelligent that thinks about these issues around what is the right standard, what is the standard helping us to do. Um, also, I've been insisting on the idea that data, share, data curation needs to be informed by some degree of familiarity with the research objects and the target system that are being um, treated, about, tre treated here, and certainly in biology this is a very strong intuition. Um, also, data curation needs to be trustworthy in some way. It needs to be seen that it needs to be recognized by the communities that are using the data, that people who are in charge of data management and data handling actually are, in so, to some extent, able to offer you a data set which is reliable, which is as much as possible free from at least blatant error and from data which are seen to be across the board unreliable. But as we said, this is actually a very, very difficult thing to provide. And also, um, there is a problem with um, trying to offer data curation, which is consistent as a practice across time and across space. And this problem is particularly obvious in longitudinal uh, data studies, in places like oceanography, epidemiology, and environmental science. But in fact, I mean, these are places where the idea of what it means to collect data through time and what, kind of cons what does consistency actually mean when we're faced with that problem is actually being thought about. Well, there's lots of other fields where there is the same exact problem, but, the, but it doesn't come out as a concern for people who are collecting and retaining the data. And in fact, a lot of modern organism biology is exactly like that. There is a lot of, if you want, longitudinal data collection, but the issues involved in actually making that data consistent across time are not really discussed as much as other issues. So the result of this is that, in fact, I mean, a lot of researchers working in fields which are um, producing these giant data infrastructures are very well aware of the fact that data curation is really lagging behind and is, to some extent, untrustworthy. And so databases themselves are rather rarely regarded as trustworthy per se. And in fact, we've encountered relatively um, 
a few examples when that's the case. One of the very notable examples of that is in the yeast community, particularly in the fish and yeast community, which is a wonderful database called PumBase, uh, which has been curated over the last 15 years. One of the reasons why the database is so well regarded is that it's exceedingly heavily curated by three people in the field who have a very high seniority and standing in the community. They've been trained by the same groups of people. They know everybody. They're very well trusted in the community. Also, this is a relatively small community with a very limited genealogy. So you actually have people who know each other, who meet at the same conferences, who have that level of um, exchange. And in many of the communities we're seeing in, in big data analytics, this is absolutely not the case. Um, so third problem I want to talk about is this idea of actually ending up making bias invisible. I mean, of course, any data is, kind of, you know, we, we, have, we have the literature on theory laziness in science. We don't need to think about, um, you know, too much about the fact that, of course, all data are to some extent could be thought of as biased. But the question is, how do you make uh, these kinds of um, provenance uh, of, of data um, visible? I mean, you could have a long discussion about this. I think this cartoon actually says it all, in a sense, where we're saying, well, we've got the big data report. We did a competitive analysis, and nobody thought to include cats. Right? That's pretty much the point I want to make here. Um, and the idea here is that big data collections actually tend to be extremely selective. So what you find is that even the largest databases in biomedicine uh, actually display the outputs of what can turn out to be very rich and English-speaking laboratories, which sit in very visible and very popular research traditions, and which deal with tractable data formats, and of course in biology that would mean mostly with sequencing data. And this is because these are the type of institutions where people have the time, the resources, and the type of personnel that can actually afford to engage in intelligent efforts of data curation. So what you also find is that the involvement of poor, unfashionable labs and people who work in developing countries and, of course, non-scientists of any sort is very low. It is always at the receiving end. These people are not involved in actually uh, formulating the standards or the labels that need to go into the databases. They're typically just recipients of whatever kind of comes up of very rich institutions, which, of course, is a problem given how important standards are in actually shaping the kind of data that go into the database and actually what can be done with them. So there's a very large and increasing digital divide, arguably, in research too here. There are inequalities of visibility, power, and locations, and these are constantly reinforced by the system of uh, relying on big data and, 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 and putting together data infrastructures in this way. And so there's a huge disparity, in fact, in the sources of data and the types of data that are actually being curated, disseminated, and reused. And there is a huge inequality as a result in what these data are potentially uh, taken to represent. So the sampling, for instance, of the kinds of populations which are considered for health research is very restricted. I'm not working with, on a project with a lot of engineers uh, using uh, data coming from social media to think about um, um, claims about uh, therapeutic and health interventions. And the, basically, the only type of data they're willing, to they're willing to consider is that that come from Twitter. And we all know the kind of people who use Twitter in this world are not exactly representative, possibly, of the kind of population that will need certain kinds of therapeutic interventions, and so on and so forth. And also there's all sorts of different ways of applying data protection law, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're seeing is the sampling of data here tends to be based on factors of convenience and factors which are institutional and financial. This is, of course, not really a novelty, but the problem is that because of the big data hype and um, this idea that actually we don't really need to worry about bias because all we need to do is triangulate the data again because there's so much of it, and there is this illusion that, in fact, you don't have to account for bias and you don't have to do, do much about sampling anymore in your research method and your analysis because the fact that you're using lots of data will automatically somehow uh, take care of this. So very quickly on the last two uh, factors I want to touch upon. Well, first of all, there is the idea that, in fact, this is becoming more and more, in some respects, self-interested science. So um, there is what, what you may well see as a triumph of commercial and opportunistic concerns um, in selecting the data, in, making sh in, in the choice of which data becomes available to whom, over um, scientific reasoning and decisions which are relating to the um, epistemic grounds on which you're carrying out an investigation. So data choice, processing, dissemination are governed by non-epistemic factors. And as I said, more tractable data in digital formats are being uh, shared and accumulated and exchanged as commodities. While in fact, databases that may be much more useful 
uh, to be retained and reused by other researchers, but are complex, are difficult to share, and actually um, remain private, remain in different labs because they don't have the means really to disseminate them, or are privatized um, by corporations that are actually have met much more means than publicly funded research to be able to capture that data and, and use it in all sorts of ways. And of course, this is a particularly important problem here in the US, where there is, in fact, still a lack of appropriate regulation over data dissemination and commercialization. And unfortunately, things like it seems like things are getting worse. And finally, I think it's worth at least noticing the fact that there is a tendency in here to encourage research that is irrelevant or damaging to society. I mean, there is a whole discourse around big and open data presenting some sort of opportunity to shake up the research system, make it participatory, make it socially responsive, make it that researchers don't need to basically worry about impact factors anymore, but what they worry about is whether their research can in some way contribute to the resolution of um, global challenges or social challenges. And the idea also that uh, it can using big data and open data can actually increase um, the citizen engagement in science and also the comprehension of citizens of what's going on in scientific structures. And we have all these movements, the citizen science movement, of course, the right to science movement in medicine, things like DIY biology, which are trying to argue this. And this is all well and good, and the European Commission has taken it on board very much and trying to push this. However, this is an obvious point. <laughs> um, engagement with data doesn't really happen in a vacuum, uh, quite the contrary. And so you get a situation where actually um, a data linkage, like uh, extensive data linkage across different data sources, involves very serious risks to individuals and to communities, which have to do with privacy, which have to do with how you do medical assessment, how you do represent people in government and social services. And in fact, um, like lots of um, organizations, including Royal Society, have published reports saying that, wait a second, actually the research outputs from indiscriminate data linkage in this area can actually end up damaging society rather than uh, leading to some form of human flourishing. And in fact, it's very important here to think about how this can help preserve human rights rather than corrupting um, human rights. And I think that's a particularly important question when one thinks about the right to science movement, which I, have, um, I found very problematic. But we can uh, discuss that uh, later if you want. So of course, there is also this dimension of being ethically sound. I mean, how do we ensure that data sharing and reuse actually um, uh, if escapes these dimensions and is actually um, ethically sound and, and socially progressive rather than uh, leading to these kinds of issues. So to summarize, how can big data and related practices damage the sciences? Well, I've been arguing that they can be used that, um, to forge tools for some sort of unregulated mass surveillance of human behavior, both at the individual and at community levels. They can actually help to produce unreliable knowledge that does not help to tackle any kind of uh, social challenge. They can help to expand existing divides and silence scientific traditions uh, which come from low resource environment and topics which are not fashionable at this point so they don't receive as much funding as uh, needed to be able to curate and disseminate data in this way. They may actually uh, be seen as eroding scientific expertise and uh, the methodological wisdom that comes with, for instance, sampling methods. And in fact, there is almost an idea in some of these uh, communities that pretty much anything online goes as long as we can kind of bring it together with other data sources. And ultimately, this can have absolutely um, horrible um, implications. And one of them, I think, is to actually further erode, if it's at all possible, uh, trust and credibility in science. And I think here, in fact, there is an exponential growth of opportunities for marketing so-called alternative facts. And this, in fact, relates very nicely to some of the work that Naomi Oreskes has been doing on merchants of doubt. I mean, imagine if this much work can be put into producing sort of fake reports on data interpretations, how much easier it is to actually start to skew some of these data collections in a way that actually follows particular interests in the same way. So what to do about this? Well, this is kind of the feeling in lots of social media these days that big data is going to impact us soon, and the only thing you can possibly think of doing is call Bruce Willis. And what I'm trying to say is that, in fact, <laughs> there could be an argument that we have some utility here. And there's a lot to be harnessed from the philosophy of science to try and um, tackle some of these issues. So first person to start from in this way is sitting in this room, it's John Norton. So um, I have found actually um, is a material theory of induction to be extremely interesting starting point in thinking about this. So the idea of actually moving away from a universal and a priori model of inductive inference and think about inductive inference as being local first and foremost, because again, it's an encouragement to think about what does make sense 
as inductive inference in a particular situation. And if data travel, and they will continue to travel more and more and more in the contemporary scientific landscape, once you are reusing them and proposing new inferences from data, what makes sense at that stage of the journey, rather than whatever came before? And I mean, there's a very, very nice quote here. I think I'm going to read very quickly. So the idea that in the practice of science, um, we find a non-hierarchical empiricism where relations of support are so tangled that no clear um, hierarchical structure can be found. And, uh, and then uh, John goes on to say, a system of propositions with this uh, non-hierarchical structure of support cannot be generated by successive inductive inferences, each relying on already established propositions only. Its construction cannot be like that of a tower whose successive courses of stones are laid in a sequence. And I think this is very comparable to what we're seeing now in the construction of this castle, if you want, to this house of cards of databases. Rather, it is like the construction of an arch of a vaulted ceiling in which some stones are supported by scaffolding that can only be removed when the remaining stones are in place. Then each stone is supported by other stones, both lower and higher than it in the arch. Now, when one thinks about scaffolds, I think uh, the next set of people that are actually very interesting in, uh, to bring in here is the people who have been working on scaffolding in cultural evolution. And among them, uh, the first name that comes to mind, of course, is Bill Winsett. This idea that, in fact, uh, we have to think about which kind of epistemic scaffolds have been put together in the course of um, research. Of course, they're thinking about cultural evolution in a broader sense, but we can think about the research world. And wh what does it mean in terms of which assumptions and techniques have become entrenched in the evolution of certain disciplines? And what can we do to try and make those commitments as explicit as possible so as to facilitate the localization of inference in particular ways? And some of the work I've been doing with Rachel Ankeny also is along those lines, trying to think about repertoires that um, researchers use as a blueprint for how to actually implement particular modes of inquiry and modes of inference. And again, talking about people that are in this room, there is the intuition very strongly that has been put forward in philosophy of science, and particularly Jim Woodward, he has a very nice quote, but I think also in the work of people like Ian Hacking and hans jörg Reitberger, that in fact one really needs to think about data, primarily recognize the fact that data are public objects, objects whose acceptability depends upon facts that can be ascertained intersubjectively. So there's this intuition on one hand, which is very important to retain, and at the same time, there's all sorts of literature on um, notions of evidence, and particularly ideas around what we mean by different kinds of evidence categories, and the idea that evidence actually is a notion that does also depend on new situation, and is not really um, always applicable to fixed objects of evidence, and I think the work of Felicity Larry and Federica Russo here is very useful in that respect. So taking all of these different intuitions together and building on them, I've been trying to propose the idea that in fact the best way to think about the starting point to start to address issues of um, kind of what we make of big data and inferential reasoning from big data in this case is to think about data as relational. So as a relational category. So the idea here is that what counts as data, in fact, varies in relation to particular research situations. And one of the um, implications of this is the idea that, in fact, any object can be considered to be a datum as long as it is treated as potential evidence for one or more claims about phenomena and it is possible to actually circulate it among individuals and groups. And so this allows you to actually think about data as a tool that different groups of researchers are using at particular points of time in relation to particular trends or potential claims. And so trying to think about data journeys are actually doing this as moving the value of what those objects are actually doing as data in research. And in fact, which objects are being uh, considered to be data in different kinds of research. So inference here becomes a process of actually situating data in relation to whatever elements uh, researchers uh, deem to be of relevance to interpretation at that particular point in time and space which would be including things like materials, instruments, the interest of the particular researchers, and the norms that their community is following. So this means actually developing a context for inquiry that aligns the purposes of researchers with existing theoretical commitments and particular properties of the data and of the target system that is being studied. So one of the things I think that um, substantiates this way of thinking about the epistemology of data is actually the fact that one of the main um, 
if you want grounds for well, one of the main goals and also one of the main ways in which databases are assessed as being of good quality is when they're actually able to enable comparison between different ways of organizing the data. So very often researchers would like to have a database which allows them to dynamically compare different ways in which data can be um, uh, ordered, they can be visualized, different parameters that can be adopted in thinking about a certain data set so they can start to think about which particular way of ordering the data suits the kind of commitment they have and the ways in which uh, they're conducting inquiry. And I think these kinds of um, intuition also sits very nicely um, in parallel to what is happening now on case-based reasoning and the ways in which we're inferring generalization for case-based reasoning. And so work, for instance, by Mary Morgan, Rachel Ankeny, and Jean Griesemer. So if one considers these kinds of ideas, then how does one think about the important question of what makes a good inference? Now, here again, there is this idea that, well, um, you know, maybe the best, the best way to think about this is as triangulation. When you triangulate different types of data sources, then you tend to have, this is one of the criteria to think about what constitutes potentially good inference from, um, from data. And now, of course, triangulating different types of evidence and, and sources of evidence is very, very important. But I don't think it's any way sufficient to guarantee that you will have a good inference. And partly it, this is because of the difficulties I've already illustrated in accounting for the partiality of the data sources one is dealing with, which in many cases is actually very, very difficult to document or even to get a sense of how partial these data sources actually may be. And also all the efforts which are required in maintaining continuity across data sets and commensurability between data sets. In particular, this is very clear when uh, one considers a situation when one tries to reassess the evidential value of one given data set uh, with different methods across time. And I think here uh, my work is um, very much um, similar to what Alison Wiley is doing when thinking about how um, different types of data in archaeology are being reassessed um, over and over again in the course of time in archaeology with different tools and with different assumptions and that actually leads to very different kinds of inferential outcomes and in fact different ideas about what counts as um, a good inference. So what Alison uh, then comes up with here, and I think that's an excellent starting point for thinking about um, inference for big data, is uh, conditions under which one can think about robust evidential reasoning. And when she thinks about this, she thinks about things like the security of the data, actually making sure that you are aware of um, the chain through which data have actually come to a situation where you can analyze them yourself, so you have something about the provenance of the data, the causal anchoring and the causal independence, of the evidence, uh, the conceptual independence of the evidence, the grounds you have to actually calibrate the evidence, and the ways you have to address divergence in the different kinds of data sets that you may be uh, dealing with. Of course, each of these would reserve like, a long discussion. But um, just to go towards a conclusion, I wanted to give you a sense of the kind of challenges I think we are facing when thinking about inference from big data, and at least some of the ways in which philosophy of science can help to address this. And just to conclude, I think this can be summarized as, first of all, trying to recognize the local and situated nature of data selection, uh, data sampling methods, and data quality assessment. And um, this particular is very important when deciding what kind of scope one assigns to the inferential claims that what makes. So if I extract a particular claim from a given data set, what do I think this applies to? How general is that claim? Becomes a very important decision that needs to take account of the situated nature of um, all the different data processes I've illustrated. Also, the encouragement is towards building accountability as much as possible for the choice and the sources of the data that go into data infrastructures and various types of analytic tools. So one of the things I've been recommending now to database managers and to the European Commission for a while is to try and track data histories as much as possible and try to track um, the ways in which data travel through different contexts by um, basically developing opposite metadata, if you want historical metadata, that actually look at the history of the data. And um, another recommendation I think that counts from these kinds of work, uh, I don't have the time to develop it here, but is to try and avoid irreversible data linkage, by which I mean situations in which you're clustering big data sources together and creating a sort of new 
a kind of you know um, integrated if you want data set and then forgetting where this data actually came from in the first place in which uh, wherever we looked at a project that we're trying to do that we actually discovered that people were trying to reuse the data sets invariably wanted to disaggregate it again and try to look back uh, to uh, the data sources um, another, I think, um, a condition that comes from philosophical work here is to try and build safeguards for social and ethical concerns to improve research methods here. And so we've done quite a lot of work looking at how ethical standards in data handli handling actually improve the epistemic conditions under which data are maintained, including how people do data linkage, how one supports kind of secure information very much along Alison Wiley's lines, and facilitating data mining. And I think all of this can really help to promote robust evidential reasoning. And I'll leave it at this and help my, um, thank very much my collaborators in doing this work. Thank you for your attention.